produce today's presenter, which is Nala Al Malki, and she is an ELT consultant based in the UAE. She holds an MA in TESOL from the University of Manchester, as well as a Delta and CELTA qualifications. She has collaborated with different ministries of education, language centres and publishing houses around the regions uh, on various, of, various educational reform initiatives. She has a special interest in teacher education, particularly in the area of teacher beliefs. Nala is a certified CELTA trainer and has in-depth experience training teachers in public and private sectors. So over to you, Nala. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for the introduction. And uh, welcome everybody to the session. I'm very happy to um, see everybody here. Uh, let me just share my screen so I can... Um, Okay, yep. So very happy to see everybody here um, and very happy to see such a variety of um, countries that you're coming from. I saw some people from Brazil and China and a lot from the Middle East and Europe, Baku. Um, I realize for some of you, it might be very early. So um, I highly appreciate you joining us today. I will try to make this as engaging and light uh, as possible so we can all uh, really benefit from it. Um, as Simon said, if you do have any specific questions, please put them on the Q&A box. However, I will be asking you every once in a while um, to interact with me and I will be asking a few questions, you know, just to get a feel of your experience and background. So if you can use the chat box for that, I'll, I'll look at that briefly, but not the whole time. Um, yeah, and do tune into the other sessions. There's bound to be so many interesting things. Even if the topic doesn't seem like it's very interesting to you, you'd be surprised how many things you can um, benefit from. So today's session, as Simon mentioned, is about motivation. And I think that's an area that a lot of teachers, uh, students, parents, employers, everybody's always concerned about motivation um, because I think it's a universal issue, uh, regardless of age, culture, um, context. However, I do think that it's a bit more uh, of an issue with young adults or people in um, who are just joining universities and all of that because in a lot of these contexts, um, learning is not yet voluntary. It's something that probably was forced upon them in so many different cultures and areas that they had to go to these courses or had to do with these classes. And um, when we become adults, I guess we realize that we're learning a lot more than we were when we were young learners, um, because then you're just learning through play, learning through interaction, learning through games. Um, and sadly, as adults and in different parts of cultures as well, we associate learning with something being difficult or boring or um, not as, as, as fun as doing anything else. So um, motivation is very much about shifting that mindset and trying to get our learners uh, genuinely and naturally um, engaged with something. Um, okay, so let me first of all start with um, a quick overview of what we're gonna be covering today. So first of all, we're gonna talk about what motivation is, simply put. I'm not gonna be going into so much detail uh, with the psychology behind it and all that, just practical terms. And what does it mean for us, for our students, for our classroom and for our learning process? We're gonna talk about why it's important. So the benefits that we reap once we really work on motivation in our classroom through the different areas that I'm gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna talk about why content is key um, to creating or to nurturing the right kind of um, motivation um, and how we can customize it. What practical ways can we make um, content, a way to engage and motivate our learners. We're going to talk about building a community sense. So, and we're going to be discussing the difference between that and between um, engaging competitive behavior. So these two things are not the same um, and how building this can really as well benefit our learners and our learning process overall. And we're gonna look at practical examples, of course, and things you can apply in your own context. And finally, uh, we're gonna look at some tips and practical um, points that you can, again, translate to your context. So just relax and hope you enjoy today's session. And um, as I said, I will be asking you questions every once in a while. So if you can pitch in there in the chat box, that would be great. So first of all, what is motivation? Obviously we said before that a lot of people are always talking about motivation because it's in every element. It's not just in education, it's, it's almost in everything in our lives, it's a key area. Um, so there's a wealth of definitions for it, obviously, um, many different terms. I've picked out a few that I found relevant for us in our context, and I'm gonna look at them and try to find the common area between all of these different definitions or descriptions or whatever you want to call them. So motivation gives the reason for action, desires, and needs. So the reason, the power, the push, 
um, motivation is about arousing interest and sustaining it. And I'm not sure if any of you have attended um, the other sessions that have been happening, not through this conference and previous Cambridge conferences, but there's been a lot about um, research done by Sarah Mercer and Dorney that talks about engagement and learning, which touches a bit on motivation. And um, there's a framework that was developed there that talks about the willingness to engage, um, which is the first step, and then um, the trigger to engagement or the arousal, and then finally the, the maintenance or the sustainability of this engagement. And this very much, I think, translates to motivation as well. Um, to motivate someone and to get them interested, we need to kind of arouse that interest. We need to wake it up. And then we also need to think about how we can maintain it because it's not just a one-off thing that you, it's not a switch that you turn on and it just stays there. Um, motivation is the length and direction of effort. So it's how much effort you put in um, into a certain task or achievement that you want to get to. It's a desire, it's the energy. And then finally, as I said before, so a lot of these words you see that they're being repeated here and there, the trigger, the reason, the instigation. So it's that power that kind of gets people um, engaged and interested and motivated. Um, so overall, as you can see, a lot of different terms, a lot of different things, but the idea is that we need to get to the bottom of motivation. Um, just like when you get sick or you feel unwell, you go to the doctor. You don't want them to just right away give you medicine and then shut you off, but you need to figure out what is the root of the issue? Why is it happening? So that's what we want to try to get to. Why are the students um, demotivated? Why are they not interested in so-and-so? Work on the root of the issue to try to solve it. Um, so motivation is obviously an umbrella team that covers so many different areas, so many different aspects. But today, of course, we're not gonna be able to go to every um, single aspect, but we're gonna be focusing on content and community as I mentioned in my title. Um, and it's about choosing to persist in something, persist in, on a task, um, but it's not just a simple choice. So many different valuable uh, variables will affect it. Um, but as we said, it is a universal issue and it does um, translate into two different, very different contexts. So why is motivation important and why are we um, having this talk simply about it? Um, first of all, when, you, when your students are naturally and are keen and are motivated, you get so many different benefits in terms of the learning process. So for example, the academic performance is um, increased. Um, you can see that in results, in the way they um, achieve their task, in the way they um, even sit for exams, if you want to think of that as a measure. Uh, the adjustments they make um, for in the classroom for a specific task or activity, if they're motivated to do it, if they're genuinely interested and motivated, you'll see that they're, they do everything they can to kind of get to it just because they're interested and, and motivated. The skills they employ, the variety of skills, um, their well-being and happiness, they're, they're just happier students and happy students get good results. Um, and in turn, I'm sure happy teachers as well. Uh, the energy that's brought into the classroom, the persistence despite challenges, despite hurdles, this is all, um, all, you, this is all things that you can see once your learners are truly motivated. Um, the thinking and the reflection on their tasks. So they start on their own. Once they're motivated, they start to think of why did this go well? Why did this, didn't this go well? How can I improve it? How can I learn from this process? Without you having to do much, this is an internal process that is sparked within them if they're doing something or if they're engaged in something that they are truly motivated to do or interested in doing. Their creativity um, is enhanced. Uh, think about yourself as a student, as a teacher, as a human. Um, when you're interested in something, you start becoming creative about the way you think about it, about the way you process it, about the way you um, deal with it. So this is a natural um, reaction that happens. Your increased self-regulation or the student's self-regulation, again, because the whole process is enriched, um, your mind automatically starts thinking of ways to achieve it. Um, your, the, your, the way that the students will manage their time, the way that they organize their learning, everything becomes um, a lot more access, access, accelerated and a lot more efficient when they are motivated. And finally, the long-term effect um, in practical life, really. So if there's been a lot of research recently that says that if you are actually motivated as a learner in your schooling years or early university years, um, then that actually translates into your professional life and you can be a lot more motivated if you've had that before, if you have that experience. Um, because it is important just as much in your um, educational um, journey as it is in your professional journey. You need to be as well motivated and invested 
and interested in what you're doing. Um, so obviously, I don't need to convince you anymore that this is a very important area that we do need to be focusing on. Um, now, the question that comes next is what comes first? Um, motivation. So you'll hear a lot of teachers um, tell you, sadly, um, that my students are not motivated. My students are not interested. They have no motivation. Then there's nothing I can do with them. And they just go through this excruciating teaching journey. Um, you know, whether it's a unit or a topic or a task, you know, they just say the st students are not mo motivated. So I can't do anything about it. So I just have to kind of ride it through, go through the pain and just suffer for that whole week. And then it'll pass. Um, so, you know, sadly, that's not a really good mindset to have. Um, because motivation just doesn't come out of nowhere. It's okay, yes, there are um, internal aspects that motivate our students. If we're going to talk about intrinsic motivation and all of that, um, their background experience, their culture at home, their culture with different schools, etc. Yes, there are so many other areas that affect it that are beyond your control, but there are also so many things that you can control. And one of them is giving them successful learning experience. So it's more like a cycle. So it doesn't really start from somewhere and just continue. Um, but it doesn't come from a vacuum. You need to give them that motivation uh, or you need to provide the right conditions. And a lot of these conditions are actually in your hand as a teacher. Um, and when I say a lot, that doesn't mean it's, it's gonna be something hard and difficult. As you'll see today in today's session, it could be very small tweaks, very small adjustments that you make to the way that you deliver content or the content that you have or the way that you manage the, class, the classroom dynamic that could really affect motivation and um, increase it in, in such an amazing way. Um, it's just about how to do it properly. Uh, but we can't just think, you know, the students are not motivated, so there's nothing I can do. Um, so how can I choose and customize the content uh, to make it important for our students or to make it relevant and interesting for our students? And why should I be doing this anyway? Um, I've got a lot of different categories here. And the first one, I don't know if you can guess from the picture, what do you think I'm going to be talking now about in terms of content and students? You can type in the chat box what you think, uh, what you can guess, what you think. Rock and roll, singing, music, okay, something else, maybe a bit misleading. Speech, good, speaking. Speech, okay, audience, something close to that. Okay, voice, thank you very much, yes. So the idea of voice, we need to incorporate our students and our learners voice um, into our learning process. After all, they are adults. I mean, even as children, we are now more and more telling them that we need to hear from you and see what you like and what you're interested in in order for you to excel in your learning or to really be invested in your learning. But more importantly, for adults, we need to hear from them or for young adults, whoever you're teaching. So the idea of voice, and this actually proved to work very well during lockdown when a lot of teachers had to go online and the teachers who were very open with their students and were um, keen to take in from what they wanted to do and how they wanted to manage the online process or what they wanted to learn about in this specific period actually uh, thrived. While teachers who remained you know, in their box, whatever what they planned, regardless of the situation, um, struggled a lot within that process. So the idea of voice and listening to our students because it gives them that agency, um, that feeling of power over what they're learning. And we're lucky enough that we're dealing again um, whether it's about the level or the age, et cetera, we're dealing with learners who are able to voice these things. They're able to formalize their interest, uh, to vocalize their interest and communicate them. Even if you are, if your students, for example, their English level might not be as strong, um, you know, depends on your learning establishment. Maybe you can have some of these conversations in L1 to find out what they're truly interested in. Um, again, giving them that control. And the idea is that learning is dialogic. So you need to have that back and forth relationship between you and your students, perhaps um, start the term or the course or the unit by having a very detailed needs analysis of what you wanna learn about, what topics do you wanna explore, what things interest you and how can we fit that in with our academic English context. Um, brainstorm things together, observe them simply, look at what, they're, what sparks their interest and try to take it from there. Um, I'll give you another example here, which is not really from the academic context, but I've read a book recently about, it's called The Brave Learner, and it's about a children mainly who have shifted into a, um, an unschooling approach or a homeschooling approach. And you find that these students thrived so well uh, once they were taken out of these boxes of you have to do unit one, which talks about X, Y, Z. Once they were given the lead of choosing what they want to learn about, 
um, everything came to place, you know, their math skills, their science skills, their English skills, because they were truly interested in something. And we have to remember, especially for us teaching English um, uh, and teaching it for academic purposes, you have to remember that the topic or the, the purpose is not really the content. It's not about learning about X, Y, Z. It's about the skills, the speaking, the writing, uh, the vocabulary. So it doesn't matter if we replace the content. It's if they're achieving that objective of being able to speak or present or write an academic essay or write a comparative analysis. Um, these are the things that matter. So it's fine if we have that power or if we give them that power to change what they want to learn about. Um, so that's one area that we need to think about when we customize or we choose our content. And then another area will be obviously, what do you think based on this picture? What do you think um, will it be? Progress, okay. Success, effort, scaffolding. Thank you very much, scaffolding, development, levels. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm glad that picture worked. Um, so yes, we need to make sure that it's at the right pitch, at the right level, because if something's too easy, then you lose interest. And if something's too challenging, then as well, uh, you lose interest and it becomes kind of demotivating. Um, so we need to really be careful of what we pitch. But it's, again, um, the same point that I mentioned earlier, it's not so much about the content itself, it's about what you do with it. So you could have a very sophisticated, detailed um, piece of text, but it's about the tasks that you set with it that could still make it work, depending on how you pitch it, how you deliver it. Thank you. Uh, somebody said the method and differentiation. Um, and it's about that resultative motivation to find out that they are able to achieve something once they taste um, the taste of a successful, um, effective, motivating, um, enriching learning experience. They will have that kind of, how do you call it, like addiction to, to go again and again and try to succeed and try to work and try to do all of these things. Um, results of motivation is very, very important. Um, and it's something we need to give to our students. Uh, sometimes it's, that's why it's, it's, it's worth the time we invest in making and tailoring a very um, good, successful lesson with suited content, because once they feel that what it's like, they will want to do it more and more. But if we're stuck in a cycle of, you know, boring, um, not interesting, irrelevant lessons that are really um, everybody's struggling with, then it becomes very difficult to get out of it. What about this? What do you think this image is talking about? Uh, complexity caged structure. Thank you very much. Variety. Excellent. That's exactly what I was talking about. So the idea is that we can create these playlists of things that your students enjoy, um, things that your students are engaged in or they like, different activities, different delivery methods. And we're going to look at that more in the next slide. Um, having these playlists, kind of like how you would listen to music, for example, on um, Spotify or iTunes or, or your list on um, Netflix. Um, having that gives you that structure um, so it gives you variety and gives you structure. So you can sit and invest the time with you and your students and even your colleagues in the same uh, department and think these are the things that we can do to make this content come to life or this is the, um, the methods that I can represent this content to make it interesting. And I will draw on these every once in a while to give variety to my classroom, to, the, to give um, excitement and surprise into my context. Uh, and finally, I'm going to not guess with you this time because I realized um, we, we don't have that much time, is uh, the idea of links and connections. Thank you. You already guessed it. Very, very happy it worked. Um, so the idea of links. Yes, we need to find these links because the, the whole concept of cost customizing our content is all about us opening these windows for connections, for making that link between the student and what they're learning, whether it's an emotional appeal, whether it's... Um, a cultural interest. You know, there's so many different ways that we can make these connections, but we need to think about them um, and not just take whatever we have for granted. Um, so whatever is in the book, I'll just do it regardless. Even the most incredible course book out there um, will not always fit your needs because everybody's so different. So we need to take that effort to find these links and establish them, find these connections, think about the different perspectives. Um, and that's really our job, just to find these um, connections. So as we said earlier, um, oh, sorry, we're still talking about this. So yeah, so in terms of content, we said what we needed to do earlier and what are the things that we need to think about. And now these are the things that we can bring in variety. So we can think about the delivery methods, how we can deliver this content. For example, instead of it being um, a long text or not instead of it, 
in conjunction with it being a long text, we can bring in some visuals or some infographics. Um, we can bring some applications, some apps that helps them engage with this content. For example, one of the Cambridge products, the English Unlock Second Edition, has an app component for most of the content of the book, which makes it a lot more interesting um, for a lot of the students that they, they can have it in their palms um, and they can look at it. Um, videos, so many different things. And we're so lucky at this point of time because there's so many good content out there and not what it was like 10 years ago when all you can find is conversations between John and Jack um, talking about their summer holiday. No, there's actually a lot of nice documentary style um, reporting material that is still simple and fit for your learners um, to use in an academic context. So we need to think about these things. Again, not saying to replace what you already have, but to um, supplement with this just to open that window and how to interact with the content um, simply by bringing in enjoyment bringing in fun because again think of yourself as a learner um, or as a person you just want to have fun when you're learning it doesn't mean that it has to be boring the idea of gamification thank you somebody had just said that incorporating games um, not through the whole lesson, but it could be simply with different aspects. For example, um, if you're dealing with specific vocabulary or functions, you can bring in a board game, you can bring in an app, um, so many different things that you can do. Um, problem solving, um, riddles, puzzles, and all of that. Again, because it's actually things that we do need for them um, to develop their critical thinking skills. So having this as part of the content is very, very important to motivate them, to engage them. Um, thank you, somebody said here, fun makes learning easy. So having these things is a, is a very important thing to motivate our learners to become much more engaged. So yeah, again, so it's about opening these windows for better learning simply um, and to pave the way for this unavoidable content because sometimes you don't have the choice. Sometimes you can't change what's in your book, but at least having these steps here, having a video here or a game here or an infographic or uh, something they can do at home even, even if you're not, um, if you don't have the time to do it in your classroom, this can be part of flipped learning classroom, uh, flipped classroom. So you can give them some content to look ahead of time, just to spark their interest, just to get them motivated and interested um, in what you have in your classroom. So let's look at an example here of how we can, how this is actually done in our classroom. So I'm going to have a quick here um, chart. Um, let's say we've had these content in our book that could use some improvement or could be replaced. And let's say the topic is of the unit is foreign historical figures. Um, it could be about, you know, invention, someone who invented electricity or whatever. Yes, obviously for a lot of us could be interesting, but for some it might not be. So what potential do I have here? And we have two scenarios. We've got a scenario where our establishment will not um, give us that freedom. So it's rigid and it tells you, you have to cover every single page. So what do you do then? And this is when you simply, instead of just, again, riding through, having an excruciating week of very boring content that's not interested or relevant to them, use their voice to tweak it. This is the time for you to go back and look at that needs analysis or the brainstorming session that you had of what they're interested in um, and try to tweak it there. So for example, um, to open a window, they can talk about historical figures from their culture, or they can talk about people that are not necessarily historical figures. It could be people from their um, from sports or local celebrities or local influencers or net legends, whatever it is to spark that interest. At the end of the day, again, it's not about the content. Um, let's say that the objective of the unit is that they have to write a comparative essay about different figures. Then they can still do that, even if it's a bit different. Um, and then there's the lucky um, part of the, the chart here, where the people that have that choice to do whatever they need to do. Um, so you can go ahead and replace the whole content based on what they said, but you need to make sure that you're mapping that objective against the new content. So again, if the objective of that unit or that writing aim was comparative essays, we can still apply that to a different topic or consult them. Actually, they might surprise you, even though you might think this is boring or disinteresting, or maybe last term it didn't work with your students, ask them this time, because you never know. Groups are different, uh, students are different, their um, interests and backgrounds are different. Um, and yes, you can tweak using variety, using the playlists or the methods that I showed you earlier. Now, what about building the community sense and why is it uh, important? So I'm gonna show you here three pictures. What do you think is the difference between these three? Um, the first one, okay, 
collaboration, Nur al-Huda just said collaboration, teamwork. Do you think all of these images are um, talking about group work and collaboration? Different communities, thank you. Teamwork. So yes, somebody said no, this, these are not all the same. And yes, that's right. So the first one, um, you've got this group of meerkats, I think, and they're there together, but um, they're not necessarily collaborating. They're just coexisting in a community. They are a community, but they're just there. Um, but then you have this group of cyclists who are competing in a community. They're working against each other, let's say, um, because they care about their individual goals. No offense to any cyclists here, if there's anybody. And then finally, these are the ones that are actually collaborating. Um, they're working together for a specific goal, for a common goal. They're there to uplift each other, to help each other, to grow together. Um, and this is what we want to see in our classrooms. Uh, we want to see this positive interdependence, this team spirit. And that's what will make, again, the whole experience so different um, for us as learners and teachers. So a team approach, true community, is where we have a team approach where the success of each member um, is needed and everybody cares about everybody else's success. Um, it's that team effort, it's that acceptance, it's that approval amongst each other, it's the idea that it's a safe place, it's a place for you to make mistakes or, um, or fall and tumble and somebody else will pick you up and help you because at the end of the day you all want to reach the finish line. It's not just one of you needs to be first, second and third and that's what we need to foster in the classroom and a lot of that relies on you, the teacher, um, and that's how you um, you are the one that's in charge of fostering this feeling. Now, what things do we need to think about when we try to foster this? As we said before, the positive independence. So um, it's not competitive. It's about mutual respect. It's about reliance on each other. Um, it's not for assessing and judging each other. No, it's a way for us to all grow together to work on a common goal. Um, the group size is very, very important because too big of a group and um, the roles are lost and some people might be relying on somebody else, you know, uh, hitchhiking or taking each other's uh, places. While too small, uh, it means there's too much burden on uh, one or two members of the group. The safe trust, again, again, I keep talking about that. Um, we need to establish this and that's why you need to lay the groundwork and we're gonna talk about that in the next slide, is that you need to establish that trust, that feeling among them um, to feel safe, but also challenged that nobody's gonna judge me. And if I make a mistake, it's still okay. And if I need help, I can ask my colleague and I can ask my uh, group member to help me for us to achieve this. And this does so much for motivation, knowing that you're safe, knowing that you're there to succeed, knowing that you're working. Um, is very, very important. Clarity and uh, definition. So being very clear and specific about what you expect them to do, what their roles are, what the objective is, what the purpose is, is very, very important. And the planning. Um, and I find this to be very, very important because a lot of teachers, unfortunately, they see this task online that says collaborative learning or a section in the book that says that. And they just think that by doing it, that it's automatically going to be collaborative. Automatically, they're going to have that community feeling. But in reality, so much planning takes place. Just because four people are sat together working on something, it doesn't mean that they're collaborating. It could be just them working side by side and that's it. But so much work is needed ahead of time to prep them. And obviously, if you're all or any of you are in an online teaching context, this all still applies there. You can still harvest this. You can still create this through all the different platforms. Um, again, just about laying the groundwork first, uh, making sure that everybody knows what they have to do. Um, so in practical terms, what can we do and how can we do this? So let's say, again, we have the same topic, the idea of historical figures. We need to start, as I said, by defining and communicating the goals and objectives and the purpose. We need to have very lengthy conversations before. And I say very lengthy, but I don't want you to think of it as time consuming because it's the best investment you'll make for your classroom. Um, because again, once you do it once or twice, but truly um, in the right sense, then it will flow so much easier the next few times. And again, they'll be hooked on it because they'll have that resultative motivation that we talked about earlier plan for success. And by that, I mean, having these lengthy discussions. Again, if your place allows, place of work allows, then please have some of these in L1 if you think language might be a barrier at some point. Discuss what it is, what it truly collaborating and working together in a community means. Uh, set the expectations. What do you expect each one to bring in? Explore the roles. What do you mean that he's the script? What do you mean that he's the researcher? What do you mean that her, she's so-and-so? So you need to really sit and think and obviously rotate these roles. 
um, and that build that space familiarity, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, show them where can they get the resources? Where can I get this and that? Where can I research this? Uh, what app can I use for this? Have them ready, set them up for success again. Don't just tell them work together, create an essay. No, don't tell them work together, create a presentation. There needs, there's a lot more than that. I need to sit and hold their hand a bit in the beginning um, to make sure that they can achieve this. And then finally, and I think most importantly, is monitoring and reflecting and then intervening. Both you and your students, tell them, let's do this together and let's see what worked, what didn't work, and let's think about it, let's enhance it, let's advance it. Um, journal, write down, um, these steps are very, very important. And don't just think it's a two minute thing that you do at the end, you need to really invest time in it. So moving forward, what can I do? Uh, yes, somebody said predict challenges, excellent, thank you. And, and have that done with by you and your students. So what I need you to think about here before we um, move into our Q&A, I don't want to um, take from that time, um, I want you to think of learning. So learning, I think we've all established that learning is nonlinear. Learning goes up and down and it's a cycle. And the same thing for motivation, it might dwindle. Um, think about yourself um, as, again, a student, a teacher, a learner, a parent, whatever it is. Um, you go through phases of motivation and that's completely fine. Uh, the trick is for you to start thinking and considering what motivates me, what motivates other, and how can I reach that? Um, because once you establish these and once you empower your students to think about what motivates them, um, they'll be able to seek it and find it themselves. And they'll tell you and communicate, tell you, I want to do this instead of this. Practice what you preach. This is so important, even in adult context. You need to show them that you're motivated yourself. If you're going in, dragging your feet, doing page three, activity four, um, they're not going to see you motivated. And in turn, it's not going to be motivating for them as well. It's, it's contagious almost. So you need to show that. Show passion for your content. Tell them, I found this very interesting topic that I want to talk to you. And I looked through this and that, and I want to do it with you. Show them your excitement. And that will translate to their context as well. Show them how you collaborate as well with your peers. Tell them, I spoke with Dr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so, and we worked together and we came up with this um, session for you and I hope you like it and we did this and that. Show them that you do these things and they will do it themselves. It's not just with children, it's with adults as well and young adults. Stay flexible though. Um, don't hit your health, you know, don't um, over um, estimate what can happen just from one session. Um, remember, you can't control everything. You're not reading their minds. There's only certain things within your control. If they've had a bad day or a bad term, you can't control that. But um, at least you know that you're trying to do your part there and then you can reflect on it later and enhance it next time. Keep a balance. Not everything has to be tailored a thousand percent. Not everything has to be this huge collaborative task um, to avoid burnout for you. And also you, they need space to express themselves individually. And finally, and most importantly, please reflect on this. Diagnose what's happening. Think about it from different angles. Think about it across the term or across the course and discuss it with them, adjust it, update it. It's a process that is ever changing. So you need to keep that in mind because not one lesson or one topic will not work for all of your students at all times. You need to have that reflection. All right. And I think that's it from my part. Um, I can hand over to uh, Simon. Yes, thank you very much. Great stuff, Nala, excellent on a slightly rainy, gray morning <laughs> here in Cambridge. I think motivation is the perfect topic for us <laughs> to, start, to start the conference. Uh, do keep the questions coming in. I've got a few here already. Please use the Q&A box for that, not the chat box. Um, so let, let's just start here with one question. Um, just a couple of little things, actually. What, what do you mean by agency? And that was on the slide, uh, choosing and customizing content. Yeah, um, agency is about the power of um, feeling of power that they'll have, the feeling of control, uh, of voice um, to your students. So it's not necessarily something you're giving them. It's about the topic that I just said. If you give them that, that voice to say what they're interested in, and if they actually see you incorporating um, what you recommend or what you say, then that's that sense of agency, that feeling that they actually are in charge of their learning, not just doing what, you've, what they're told all the time. Okay, excellent. Thank you. That was from Maida. Next question from Bassett. Uh, what was the name of the Cambridge app you mentioned? I don't know if you can... Um, that's, that. that's actually with the book. So it's, um, it's with the students who are using um, 
uh, unlock second edition. They have a compatible app oh, that works okay. with it. So it's not really independent of it. Um, sure. Yeah. That's fine. Um, another question from Anonymous is, is team learning and collaborative learning different? Um, you know, that's something I was going to mention actually in the slides and I forgot. Um, you know, sometimes we're so locked down with all the terminology of what's collaborative learning, what's community learning, what's group work, what's that. Um, and you'll find so many different sources and so many different authors will give you different names and terminology and all that. Um, so I don't, I can't really tell you exactly because it depends on who your source is and what they've said. Um, but what I'm talking about today specifically, that feeling of community and like collaborative learning is about working together versus working in parallel. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that answered that question, but I, 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 I stay away from kind of defining specific things because I don't know what they've read and what they are referring to exactly. Okay, thank you. A question here from uh, Najib. It seems that we're always focusing on how to motivate students, but we forget about teachers. <laughs> Yes. Uh, how can we motivate teachers since they're the ones that need to motivate their students? Great question. Thank you. Um, I think that the fact that a lot of you are here, um, um, I hope that means that you're all motivated to make your learning process uh, for your students and for yourself better. Um, I think in terms of from a professional development aspect of it, I think if you are in a managerial position or in a leadership position, then you need to make sure that these um, these chances for professional development for your learn for your teachers are not a burden on them. So it's not something they have to do after they've been teaching from nine to six. It's something that's incorporated. Um, if you're asking them to be engaged in some sort of action research, et cetera, then allocate time uh, from their schedule to do this um, and, and tell them to reflect on it and make their research relevant to what they're doing in their classrooms. I think that will motivate them all rather than feeling that all of this is a burden, an extra burden on them. Oh, okay, um, and hi to everyone listening in on Facebook, actually, we are streaming Facebook Live. Uh, question here from Nipan, uh, how can we create activities combining growth mindset and motivation? I'll do that. As the questions are getting harder now, so. Yeah, yes, it's getting <laughs> tricky, Simon. I thought you'd choose easier. Um, I, I, I'm trying to understand the question, actually, if you could repeat that again. <laughs> yeah, can we create activities combining growth mindset? I think that was mentioned in the talk, and, and motivation. We can, um, give you, we can give you a minute on that and come back to it if you want. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. Uh, there's quite a few questions about studying um, online. There's a question here. Are there um, any tricks to establish a good rapport uh, with students in, in a Zoom space or maybe on an online space? Yeah, I think, I think investing in these... Um, so again, I mean, it depends on your context, how many students you have, but if you can spare the time to have individual, even five minute sessions, individual sessions with your group uh, before it starts, before the class starts, I think this will really, um, you know, give you a lot of benefit for them, for you to be able to establish that one-to-one -one rapport. Um, but then otherwise, it's simply, you know, it's simple things like having your camera on, you know, I see a lot of classes, sadly, where the camera's off. So I think it's very impersonal and you don't have that connection with them. Um, you know, I'm assuming if you're using Zoom, you're also using other platforms to check on work and submit work. So making sure that your content or your comments are personalized, it's not just, you know, cliche things like good work, etc. I think all of this really, um, it makes a difference or sharing a bit of personal stuff. It's the same way that we do it really face to face um, uh, makes a difference. Just making these small tweaks of how much personal information we share or about our interest as teachers or our journeys as teachers uh, that builds rapport and that helps. Excellent, thank you. Uh, sort of a comment here from Hawker, thanks for this. Um, I, think he, I think he's saying about competition and races amongst learners would be, would be motivational um, could you explain this? Uh, yeah, how can, how can, so the, the questions are coming in so fast it's disappeared off screen. How can okay. racing and, and competing amongst learners would be motivational, please? Could you explain this? Do, do you understand what we... Um, I, I, I did have in one of my slides, I was talking about competition versus yeah. community. And yes, of course, competition is also motivating at some point, but I think sometimes um, competitions can become toxic as well. So if you're doing this too much and it's always about who's mm -hmm. the best, who's the fastest, um, who's the, you know, the greatest, then it actually becomes very demotivating for others. It's that mm -hmm. one or a few people shining. And that's yes. why I think I lean more towards the collaboration. I'm not saying there's no room for competition. Competition is always good at some point, but maybe we should 
have a bigger percentage allocated to collaboration um, versus um, competition. Sure, just uh, another couple. So is it important to understand your students' goals with English to help Definitely. them set a course to get to get them motivated? And, and what happens if they don't have any goals? How can how can uh, those be set perhaps for them? Yeah, I think, yes, that's a very important point. And it is very important to know their goals. I mean, it depends so much on your context, whether you're teaching at a university or a center, etc. Uh, sometimes that's that that job is kind of done for you because they're all following the same program, reaching the same end. Um, but if they're not even aware of their goals, then yes, you need to sit with them and and um, kind of discover these goals together. And that's where that one to one rapport makes such a uh, important uh, difference. So having to sit with them and think, what do you need out of this? Uh, what is your professional or academic life look like? What are you missing? And again, I go back and again, and I say, sometimes if you can have some of these conversations in L1, I'm not saying have full lessons in L1, I think that gives them that um, ability to truly express themselves and find their own goals. There's so many resources you can find online um, about self-reflection, self-evaluation, self-assessment, and all of that for them to really think of what they need. Um, and you can tweak and adjust as you see fit in order to find these set goals that they can work on. And, and that will definitely make them a lot more motivated. Um, thank, and better thank you. I think, I think we're just going to end on one nice question, actually. Um, mm -hmm. We're running out of time and uh, uh, I'll tell you about some other sessions and some other things that we can, um, we can uh, all sign up for in a, in a moment. Um, but the last question I have is, how do you prevent uh, burnout in this uncertain time? Obviously, this is, uh, we, we did this conference a few years ago for the first time, and we got about 100 or so people to each talk. Uh, and I think we're clocking over, put it to about one and a half thousand this time. So people are switching online. It's, it's, it's the way things are, are going. But just to keep yourself going, really, is it back to the motivation. How, how do you prevent burnout? What, tips do you have around that? Um, actually, surprisingly enough, I would say collaboration here uh, will really help you prevent burnout. Um, you know, having a team of buddy uh, or a learning community for you as teachers, I think makes such a big difference. Um, it saves you time and effort on coming up with material all the time, um, having the, the, the pressure of always innovating mm -hmm. and coming up with something new. If you establish this network of people who can support you, um, you can share material, et cetera, that makes a very, very big difference. And at the end of the day, I also think, you know, just because I said this session, about content and all of that I, I you do not have to reinvent the wheel every single session it's about you again opening these small windows putting your foot in the door just opening these windows for um, better learning uh, but you never should feel that you have to do so many new things every single time you're teaching a lesson because nobody that's not sustainable and that's not what we want um, so yeah have, have a have a community to support you as a teacher I think that's one of the most important things yeah, I think uh, with many things in life, yes. Thank you very much for that. Uh, no, that was excellent.